I want to start with a, a hypothesis that we're being pulled today in two opposite directions. Uh, there are two powerful myths of nature that have captured our imagination. Uh, they're vividly depicted in the two depicted in the two contrasting accounts of the state of nature that we find in Thomas Hobbes and in Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And these two myths provide us with two attitudes to the natural world. They provide us with two different accounts of emancipation, and they actually provide us with two different models of the economy as well. An economy which, I'll argue later in the paper, has largely taken the place of nature for us today. Now, commentators regularly say uh, that Hobbes invented the term state of nature. It's not true. He adapted it from theological discourse. Because theologians, at least since Augustine, have been recognising a fourfold state of humanity, as it's called. Uh, a state of innocence in Eden, uh, a state of nature, as it's called, after the fall, uh, a state of grace through redemption in Christ, and then a state of glory uh, in uh, eternal life. And this heritage of the state of nature language situates the social contract in the language and the logic of a salvation narrative. And of course, the social contract adapts this theological framework to tell its own salvation story, or rather to tell two very different salvation stories, uh, one of which frames nature as the Egypt holding us captive, and the other frames nature as the promised land of our liberation. And the result of this plurality of stories is that our sense of, of who we are and how we engage with our world is riven and contradictory in modernity. And my wager is that understanding this contradiction can help us see why we're making such a mess of the climate uh, and can help us to see why we're making such a mess of the economy as well. The, the, the fundamental problem is that we don't know how to be saved anymore. So let's consider these two origins, these two salvation stories, one at a time. The first story sees nature as a conflictual and unfinished and to be subdued. And despite their, their very important differences, Hobbes and Locke both give us variations of this narrative in their uh, respective theories of the social contract. For Hobbes, the account of nature um, runs through all of his works, in, in the earlier works of the Elements of Law and De Seaway, and then in the later Leviathan as well. He's very consistent about this. And his discourse about nature is dominated by the lexicon of war. Uh, and leaving the state of nature is a story of transition from war to peace through the exercise of power. Uh, nature for Hobbes is unfinished, it's raw. It requires human intervention in order to bring it to completion. So in De Seaway, for example, he repeatedly refers to the, quote, bare state of nature. And then in Leviathan, he tweaks the language a little and talks about the mere nature. And, and this mere nature, Hobbes says, places man in what he calls an ill condition that he needs to come out of. And um, so we're understanding nature here as something like a lump of clay inviting a powerful constraint and willful imposition of form by the potter. And another important aspect of, of Hobbes' view of nature is that it's ethically neutral. Um, and it, it, this is another point that he makes systematically in the elements, in De Seaway, and then later in Leviathan as well. Nothing in nature, he argues, is inherently good or evil, but we designate it so according to our own appetites. Um, so ethically speaking then, for Hobbes, nature is a blank canvas. And the solution the way that we come out of nature for Hobbes is by the invention, of course, of what he calls the artificial man, or, or elsewhere the mortal god, of Leviathan. Uh, it's Leviathan that brings security, and in what, in the elements, he calls an artificial concord among people. So Leviathan is an artificial man, but of a greater stature than natural man. It's an imitation of humanity that's better than the original. For Locke, by contrast with Hobbes, 
the dominant semantic field when he's talking about nature isn't war, it's waste and unproductiveness. So whereas for Hobbes, nature is of no inherent ethical value, for Locke, it's of virtually no inherent monetary value. And the key to making nature productive for Locke is privatising it, making it someone's property. Uh, this is done uh, by what he calls mixing one's labour with nature. Uh, but this, this admixture can be incredibly small. One of the examples that he gives is when I'm chasing a hare, the animal, a hare, it becomes my property if I mix with it the labour of me hunting it. Uh, an example that I think has profound and disturbing uh, implications for uh, gender relations and for our relations with the natural world. I don't have to do much to mix my labour with something and therefore appropriate it. For Locke, to subdue nature is in fact to improve it uh, and crucially to bring it to completion, to help it reach its destiny, he says, uh, much no doubt to the deep existential satisfaction of the hare. And one crucial further move in Locke's account of nature is that it can be stored in monetary form, preventing it from spoilage. And this means that for Locke, money sort of acts like a second nature, like an artificial nature, but actually a better one, because it doesn't perish. And this is going to be important when I come to the economy in a moment. So that's the first story about nature. Then. The second story about nature, by contrast, sees it as a norm, as pure and as balanced. And this is Rousseau's story about nature. Now, what, what strikes us when we come to Rousseau is that the framing of nature is very different to what we find in Hobbes and Locke. Because for Rousseau, the natural is something pure, something balanced, that needs to be conserved in civil society, not overridden with something artificial. Uh, Rousseau interweaves his lexicon of purity with ideas of truth. He says that nature never lies. Uh, ideas of peace. He says men are not natural enemies. And ideas of health. Uh, he argues that most illnesses are the fault of society and could be avoided if, quote, we had retained the simple, uniform and solitary way of life prescribed to us by nature, close quote. As well as being pure, nature for Rousseau is also balanced. Uh, in the state of nature, there's a balance, he argues, between each person's needs, uh, the resources that we have to fulfil those needs, and the power that we have to procure those resources. Uh, in fact, nature actively maintains, he argues, its own equilibrium, its own form of population control, if you like, uh, through sparking volcanoes and uh, periodically stirring up earthquakes and sending down lightning to devour forests. And for Rousseau, we don't need to subdue this nature, as we do for Hobbes and Locke. What we need to do is find ways of preserving its virtues from corruption in the midst of society. And these two stories are radically incompatible. Uh, nature on the one hand has war and waste to be subdued and made productive, and nature on the other hand has purity and balance to, to be imitated and preserved, it issue in two very different social imaginaries of the natural. Now, what I want to do now is draw from these two stories, two figures, uh, as I'm trying to call them, two gestures, two paradigmatic ways of engaging with the world. And the first figure is associated with the Lockean and Hobbesian account of nature. I'm going to call it construction. Uh, on this model, nature is, is unpredictable, it's dangerous, it's a raw material that needs to be subdued and made productive. And it requires constructing, it requires an artificial intervention to bring it to completion. And in the ecological sphere, this issues, I would argue, in the ideology of the Anthropocene and in what's called geoconstructivism. Um, I'm getting my argument about the Anthropocene from uh, Frédéric Nera in his uh, book translated as The Unconstructable Earth. And he argues that the Anthropocene idea, idea legitimates the sort of subduing of nature that Hobbes commends because it, it acts, if you like, as a proof of concept. It shows us that humans can fundamentally change the conditions of life on Earth. So let's go ahead and do it. Uh, geoconstructivism is the idea that the answer to any natural crisis is to manipulate and change the relevant environmental conditions through technological means. 
So, for example, is the Earth warming up? Well, then we need to seed the atmosphere with sulphur in order to cool it down again. We need a technological solution. And this geoconstructivism uh, and the geocons who advocate for it fits perfectly in this Hobbesian and Lockean paradigm. From this view, there's no norm in nature. It makes no more sense to conserve or maintain nature than it does to conserve or maintain a lump of clay in the potter's workshop. It is there to be constructed. We've never been natural. The figure, by contrast, uh, associated with the Rousseauian view of nature, we, we might call conservation. Uh, nature is pure, nature is balanced. And that purity and balance should be conserved as far as possible within civil society. And this disposition is characteristic of what we might call a nature knows best approach to the natural world, uh, in which humans must, must bend themselves to what's perceived to be nature's laws. And this figure issues in dispositions such as the degrowth movements, for example, both financial degrowth in terms of uh, shrinking the world's economies in order to care for the natural world, and existential degrowth in, in the terms of shrinking the world's population. It issues in calls for the greening of cities and the preservation of habitats and ecosystems. And like Rousseau's position, these approaches assume that nature is in, in some way normative, that there's a healthy equilibrium that doesn't change too much over time and needs to be maintained between the natural and the artificial, between the human and the non-human. And again, these two figures of construction on the one hand and, and conservation on the other are, I would argue, incompatibly, implacably opposed one to the other. And these two views of the relationship between the natural world and uh, civil society, between the state of nature uh, and the society in which we find ourselves, also issue in two very different accounts of one of modernity's most fundamental social and political concepts namely freedom. The Hobbesian and Lockean account of nature understands freedom as being liberated from the fear and the insecurity and the unproductivity of nature through sovereign power and through artifice and through property, in Locke's case. Uh, it's a liberation, uh, in Hobbes's language, from the absolute liberty of the state of nature, which is a tyrannical liberty, through what he calls the yoke of civil society. So true freedom must be constructed out of what Hobbes calls artificial chains, enforced by an overwhelming fear of Leviathan and an absolute subjugation to the sovereign. And this is the idea of freedom that informs the account uh, of someone like Michel Foucault, I would argue, not, not a freedom to conform to nature, because nature isn't providing a norm in any strong sense but a freedom from the very idea of a nature to which I must conform. And once more, Locke's chief difference from Hobbes is his emphasis on property. Uh, law in his sec uh, Locke in his second treatise says, law makes men free in the political arena, and it does so primarily in order that we can own and inherit property and accumulate wealth. Indeed, Locke says the chief end of forming a society in the first place is the preservation of property. Uh, and for Locke, property is the ground of freedom. Rousseau's figure of conservation, by contrast, shapes a view of emancipation as liberating humanity from the imbalance and the corruption that accrues to it in society, by in part conserving and in part imitating nature. Now, as we know, the, the man of Rousseau's social contract is quote-unquote born free, but this is not the terrifying, life-threatening, absolute freedom of Leviathan, nor is it the unstable, insecure freedom of Locke's second treatise, the, the sort of freedom that's unpropitious for property ownership. It's a genuinely desirable freedom of self-sufficient contentment uh, that Locke describes in the second discourse. But as we also know, everywhere he is in chains, because the invention of private property and vainglorious amour propre and the dependence of one person on another cause humans to fall into jealous, resentful suspicion and to dominate others. And if this is how you set things up, freedom isn't something that needs to be constructed. 
on the tabula rasa of an ethically neutral or valueless state of nature. Uh, but it's something that needs to be recaptured or conserved uh, from its long gone heyday. The general will, for example, uh, is described by Rousseau as restoring natural equality among people. And once more, these two emancipation narratives leave contemporary society with, with contradictory attitudes to one of its most fundamental concepts, one of its most cherished values, namely emancipation. And finally, these two stories about nature also issue in two contradictory views of the economy. Uh, the Hobbesian and Lockean view understands the economy as fundamentally turbulent and unpredictable. There's no norm. There's no equilibrium. There's just chaotic change that needs to be managed by an agile and opportunistic can-do capitalism. And this corresponds to the view of the economy held by the neoliberal Austrian school and perhaps most clearly articulated in Friedrich Hayek's theory of spontaneous order, uh, which rejects the idea of balance and just sort of manages its way through unpredictable and turbulent change. The Austrian school is radically constructivist in the way that I define that term, in its attitude towards nature. It constructs the artificial and turbulent self-organising system of global financial markets as a rival to that other self-organising system, the natural world. Markets replace nature, markets override nature. For example, they transmute natural disasters into economic opportunities. And this is epitomised in that infam infamous burn, baby burn commentary uh, of an Enron stockbroker when a bushfire threatened power lines during the height of the 2001 California energy crisis, uh, much to the delight of the stockbroker pushing up energy prices as it burned. But, uh, and this is a key move in my argument, the Austrian school is also radically conservationist in its attitude towards its own artificial economic order. Because instead of a nature knows best mantra, it lives by the adage the market knows best. Or in Margaret Thatcher's memorable phrase, you can't book the markets. The supposedly unbiased market takes the place of Rousseau's pure and truthful nature. And the self-regulating market of periodic boom and bust takes the place of Rousseau's volcanoes and earthquakes and lightning that provide periodic population correction. So neoliberal economists treat the economy like degrowth conservationists treat nature. And this is why, as Jessica White correctly argues, neoliberal freedom is indistinguishable from the sovereignty of the market. If Austrian school neoliberalism takes a constructivist attitude, to the system of nature, then neoclassical economics, with its principle of equilibrium, corresponds to the figure of conservation. So core to the neoclassical paradigm is the principle that the economy has a natural equilibrium between supply and demand, and that interventions in the economic system should aim to maintain that equilibrium as far as possible. And this corresponds to the Rousseauian figure of conservation managing an evolving situation by seeking to retain and, and where it's possible to imitate a pre-established norm or balance. So instead of the burn baby burn of neoliberalism, neoclassicism comes to the table with a more demure balance baby, balance. But once again, these two pictures of the economy are incompatible. Either the aim of economics is to find and then maintain a preordained equilibrium between supply and demand, or it is to adapt to an ever fluctuating uh, spontaneous order, managing its way through chaotic change that it's unable to influence. In each of the themes that I've considered so far in this paper, we've found a fundamental contradiction and a tension in our modern understanding, in our understanding of nature, in our understanding of how to manage the natural world, in our understanding of emancipation, and in our understanding of the economy. And in each case, the figure of construction and the figure of conservation butt up against each other. The result, I think, is that today we're concurrently and rather awkwardly 
living in fact in two natures, two incompatible self-organising realities to which everything else must bend. Uh, one of them is the natural world, and the other one of them is the free market. And the analysis of this paper would suggest, I think, that the, the two self-organising systems are simply incompatible. We may not like the fact, but we do have to choose. Now, modernity is riven. It's caught between two incompatible stories of the state of nature that lead to two incompatible conceptions of our most fundamental value, namely freedom, and two contrasting views of how to manage our greatest and most powerful artificial creation, which is the global economy. And this is a theologico political problem. It's the result of a series of transcriptions and transmutations of the fourfold states of humanity through a state of innocence, state of nature, state of grace and state of glory into our ecological and emancipatory and economic paradigms. The way through this aporia of myth, therefore, uh, that theology has bequeathed to us, I would suggest, is by a return to the theological origin in which figures of construction and conservation are related in more complex ways uh, than modernity has been able artificially to imitate. But that uh, positive vision uh, is the subject of another paper. Thank you.